This dissection will cover the vertebral column, back, spinal nerve, uh, different components associated with the vertebral column. The objectives will be to discuss the configuration of the vertebral column and how that changes over time. The characteristics of individual types of vertebrae, those in the cervical region, etc. We will talk about intervertebral discs and the ligaments that hold those together. The muscles of the back that are on the vertebral column, so the axial skeleton and the extremities, the appendicular skeleton, so how it holds those together. So we'll talk about extrinsic muscles, and they are actually, in this dissection, muscles of the upper extremity. Then an intermediate group, which are muscles of respiration. Then the intrinsic muscles, which are true back muscles. And they are in three depths, the superficial, the intermediate, and the deeper components. Then we'll talk about the central nervous system, which obviously is controlling the muscles and all other aspects of our body function. And coming from or giving rise to that central nervous system, we will have the spinal cord and the nerve, and we can talk about some aspects of nerve blocks. So the vertebral column, originally in this particular view, one can see what the configuration is like in the embryonic and fetal state. So there is a single curvature that is concave anteriorly, and that is called a primary curvature. But as we grow more and become more vertical in our orientation, in other words, stand up and learn how to be mobile on two legs, we will take what was the single primary curvature and retain that in the thoracic region, and we will retain the primary curvature in the sacral region, but we will have a reverse curvature, so it will be convex anteriorly in the cervical region, so that's a secondary curvature. And the same thing is true down in the lumbar region. We can have accentuations of that curvature. For instance, up in the thoracic region, if its curvature is accentuated, we have a condition called kyphosis. We can also have accentuation of the curvature down in the lumbar region. When that occurs, it's called lordosis. Those changes in configuration will obviously put stress on other aspects of the vertebral column or supporting elements. If we look at the components of a typical type of vertebral element, we have the large body, which is an anterior component. So we are, this is anterior, this is posterior in the body. And in this lateral view, this would be anterior, posterior back here. So the body supports about 75 to 80% of our body weight once we stack the individual vertebral bodies up on top of one another. So an adjacent vertebral body, for example, would be up here and, of course, then another down below. So these will be stacked on each other and, again, support about 75 to 80 percent of our body weight. Projecting posteriorly from the body will be paired pedicle elements. So we can see one on each side projecting posteriorly again from the body. Interestingly, we have notches, a superior notch on the pedicle and an inferior notch on the pedicle. And when those line up with adjacent vertebral elements, so we have an inferior notch of the pedicle above and a superior notch of the pedicle below, when those line up, we create this intervertebral foramen. So an opening between two adjacent vertebrae, and those are obviously very important. If we go in an oblique manner from the existing pedicles, we have paired laminae. Again, one on each side. We see a lamina on that side, lamina on this side, and they come together, they join posteriorly, where we will have a spinous process that then projects out posteriorly from the laminae. 
we have transverse processes on either side of the pedicle lamina junction. So we now have a region where we can have our intrinsic back muscles. So if we had back muscles in this region, they have points of attachment to the spinous processes, to the transverse processes, and we will see that occurring throughout this particular region. We also have superior and inferior articular processes, or commonly called facets, and those are observable in this position. So there's a superior articular process and an inferior articular process. And what those do is they create a synovial joint with the adjacent vertebral element. So the superior articular process will be adjacent to the inferior articular process of the vertebral element above. Those two will, as I indicated, form a synovial joint so that we can have some movement uh, and some support using those particular elements. About 20 to 25 percent of our body weight is supported through these articular processes. So that is the point of those. It allows us to have some motion, some rotational and flexion extension kind of activities. So again, a synovial joint between the adjacent articular processes. So here we have a vertebral column that is showing a left lateral view, and you can see the elements all stacked up. You can clearly see the intervertebral foramen between adjacent foramen and, of course, the bodies of the vertebrae and how they are stacked up with, as we will see shortly, an intervertebral disc between each adjacent body. So we have in the cervical region seven cervical vertebrae. They are stacked up, as you can see, and here are the vertebrae indicated, each one of them separately, and we'll talk about the characteristics of cervical vertebrae. CB1 is a very unusual vertebral element. Remember, we talked about the component parts we normally see, a vertebral body, we talked about pedicles, we talked about laminae, spinous, and transverse processes. So in the context of cervical vertebrae, CB1 has no spinous process. So you can see the spinous process projecting posteriorly on other cervical vertebrae, but not on CB1. It's a small tubercle. So there's still a point of attachment for muscles in that particular region, but again, not a obvious spinous process. The spinous process on CV7 is an important one because that is the first spinous process you can palpate on the back of your neck. And it's called the vertebra prominence, the first prominent spinous process that you can find on the back of the neck. So it gives one the ability to have that landmark and count superiorly, count inferiorly for adjacent vertebral elements. CV1 also is missing a vertebral body, which is rather interesting. So you can see the vertebral body, for example, on CV5 here and on CV4, etc. But when you look at this space, this area on CV1, there is no vertebral body. What one has is an odontoid process or a dens. So what that is, is the body that should have been attached to CV1, but is now attached to the top of the body of CV2. So it is a superiorly projecting element. Again, should have been the body of CV1, but it is now superiorly projecting. So in other words, in a very diagrammatic fashion, it's this kind of a situation. So if this is the body of CV2, this odontoid process projects up superiorly from it. We have components of all cervical vertebrae that are also relatively unique. So these are some of the additional characteristics. The spinous processes tend to be split or bifid. No particular clinical problem associated with that. But what we have are the muscles coming up from below 
that attach to one side or the other of the spinous process, and that tends to cause these to be somewhat separated in the midline. We also have the articular processes that are nearly horizontal. So when they stack up on each other, again, nearly horizontal, the good news is there's a lot of motion that can occur in the cervical region. So we have pretty free flexion and extension, lateral flexion, and we have a significant amount of rotation in the cervical region. And these flat, sliding, gliding, articular processes allow that. The disadvantage is, because they are relatively flat, it is fairly easy for them to slide off of one another in whiplash injuries or uh, other kinds of trauma similar to that. We also have transverse foramen. So what these are are openings in the transverse processes. So we talked about the transverse processes projecting out laterally, but in the case of the cervical vertebrae, there is a space in it, an opening in it, a foramen. And that's significant because it allows the vertebral artery to course through this transverse foramen. So the vertebral artery, which is a branch of the subclavian, will come off the subclavian and course through the CV6, CV5, CV4, and on up. So it goes from CV6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It does not go through, for some reason, CV7, even though CV7 does have a small verte transverse foramen. But the vertebral arteries don't go through that in C. V7. So here they are all stacked up. It is a fairly good view again of that odontoid process attached to the top of the body of CV2. CV1 is so it's CV1. It's also called the atlas and it's called the atlas because it's described as holding up the head and CV2 is called the axis. The reason for that is with the odontoid process projecting up right behind the anterior arch of CV1, it allows for a significant amount of rotation at that particular location. So between CV1 and CV2, the main action is rotation. The main action between the base of the skull and CV1 is flexion extension. So it doesn't mean that other actions can't occur, it's just the primary action between the base of the skull and CV1 is flexion extension. Between CV1 and 2 is rotation. This is a view showing the vertebral arteries coursing through the transverse foramen of CV6 through CV1. So here you can see it coming off of the subclavian artery, coursing through the transverse foramen, and then going posteriorly to go through what's called the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane to then go through the opening at the base of the skull, the foramen magnum, the large foramen, to get up into the skull and form the basilar artery and that basilar artery then supplies blood to the brain, and the vertebrals also supply blood to the spinal cord. So vertebral arteries, blood to the spinal cord, we will see that again later, and blood to the brain. So the internal carotid, which is right here, that's the internal carotid, and the vertebral arteries, again, supply blood to the brain. So you got four arteries that supply blood, two internal carotids and two vertebrals. In the thoracic region, we have 12 vertebral elements. And again, they have that primary curvature. So the thoracic vertebrae are usually divided up into three regions because the superior Four of those look a little bit more like, in configuration, a little bit more like cervical vertebrae. The typical thoracic vertebrae are the four in the middle, and then once we get down towards the bottom of the thoracic vertebrae, they start to look more like lumbar vertebrae. So that's how the configuration changes in that thoracic region. So the typical thoracic vertebral element has long, sharp, 
obliquely oriented finest processes, as one can see here. So the ones that are shown here in that middle section of four vertebrae, again, very obliquely oriented, sharp, long spinous processes. You can see them a little bit there as well. Another component is that it has articular processes for forming synovial joints with the ribs of the body. So the head of a rib will articulate with the side of the body, and then the neck of the rib will articulate with the transverse process. So the rib will come around that way, a diagrammatic representation of that. Interestingly, the head of the rib, which is usually fairly good sized, can also have some articulation to the side inferior aspect of the body of the vertebrae immediately above. So in other words, the head will have an attachment to the body of the same numbered vertebral elements. So this would be rib eight that would be articulating here. And it has a small amount of attachment to the side of the vertebral body immediately above. So in this case, vertebral element TV7. So here we can see the ribs. You can get a sense of how the neck of the rib is articulating with the transverse process. You don't see the head of the rib really articulating terribly well, but you get a sense of that right in that particular view. So again, the head with the side of the body, the neck with the transverse process. Those are usually very stable joints, but they can undergo arthritic changes and trauma and be very painful when those things do occur. We then look at the lumbar region, and again, this is a secondary curvature region, and there are five lumbar vertebrae. They are, again, below the rib cage and attached, if you will, or articulating with the top of the sacrum. Those are our five lumbar vertebrae, and they are very large because they are supporting the weight of the body immediately above. So the full weight of the body gets transferred down to these lumbar vertebrae. So here we see the five lumbar vertebrae, again, with a very large body anteriorly. So large vertebral body. So again, the vertebral bodies support about 75, 80% of the weight. So you can see why these have to be fairly substantial. The other thing that's important to remember is that when we have all of these bodies stacked up on each other, that regardless of the size, as we have conditions like osteoporosis start to occur, that force from above, again, with 75, to 80% of our body weight can cause these elements to become kind of compressed. So they can be forced down and we actually do shrink with time. And this is one of the reasons the vertebral bodies get pushed down because of our weight and the fact that the bony components don't have the strength and integrity that they once had. We have large block-like spinous processes projecting out posteriorly, best seen in a lateral view, but you can get a sense of that from this superior view as well. Then the articular processes are vertically oriented and have some curvature to them. They're described as being somewhat J-shaped. The point of that is it does restrict a little bit of the movement. There is reasonable flexion and extension, lateral flexion, but the lumbar vertebrae don't like a lot of rotation. So rotation becomes problematic, and it becomes really problematic when we rotate and flex. That puts a lot of strain on the muscles that are supporting the vertebral column. So it's really important when one is lifting something that's relatively heavy to make sure they face it on rather than turn to face it. So face it square on and use the legs to lift rather than bending over, flexing at the waist. Uh, much safer to do that, uh, causing much less injury. So here in this particular view, it is pretty easy to see those large block-like spinous processes for attachment of the fairly thick 
muscles that we will have in this lumbar region. The lower portion of the vertebral column will be the five sacral vertebrae, and those tend to be fused to each other. Here we can see the sacrum as well as the adjacent coccyx. Talk about that later. But there are five fused elements that we have in the sacrum. So there are five that are fused together in most cases. And then instead of having intervertebral foramen out laterally, there are foramen that are, in this case, on the anterior surface and foramen that are on the posterior surface. And that'll come into play when we start explaining the spinal nerve and the branches of a spinal nerve. So these are anterior sacral foramen, and those foramina are for the coursing of ventral branches of a spinal nerve, ventral rami. Rami means branch. So they are coming out at us from this particular view. So going back, we have these elements that are fused, and you can get a sense of a fusion line between the adjacent sacral vertebral elements. So this is SV1, SV2, and so on. So there are, again, five that are fused, and uh, it's pretty obvious. Now, it is possible for the first element Instead of being fused, it's possible for it to be separate from the rest of the sacrum. And if that happens, if that element is separated, that's called lumbarization. So, in other words, it seems like the SV1 is actually a sixth lumbar vertebrae. It looks like LV6. It would be LV6. So, what that does, what that causes, is increased mobility because now you've got another element that is not fused. So there's increased mobility, but anytime you have increased mobility, you have decreased stability. So it does create some potential issues uh, because of this particular situation. The other component that one needs to consider is that sometimes the fifth lumbar vertebra, LV5, is actually fused to the top of the sacrum. So that particular situation is called sacralization. So just the opposite situation is occurring here. We have decreased mobility to some extent in this lumbar region, so we have increased stability. So that's sacralization, when LV5 is fused to the top of the sacrum. Lumbarization is when SV1 is separated from the top of the sacrum. This is now a sagittal view. So the left side of the sacrum is cut away. And what we can see there are the posterior sacral foramen. So that's where the posterior or dorsal branch will be coming out. In the inferior aspect of the sacrum, we have the sacral hiatus. Hiatus is an opening, and so there is an opening in the very bottom of the sacrum, and there are a couple of nerves that will exit there. So it'll be for exiting of S5 and the first coccygeal spinal nerve. So CO1 will come out there as well. So this is another view. This is a transverse view. Anterior is here and posterior is here. And again, it's cut in about the middle of the sacrum. So we have the anterior sacral foramen in that location for passage of a ventral ramus. And the posterior sacral foramen is there. So the dorsal ramus would come out through that opening. And we will still have some nerve roots that'll be descending to lower levels in the canal that we have existing in the sacrum. And then the last thing we have are the four fused coccygeal elements. They are relatively unimportant. They are variable in size. They do tend to be fused, although there is commonly some mobility between the bottom of the sacrum and the top of the coccyx. This is that region of the body where if we happen to fall posteriorly, we land on our gluteal region, it is really, it is possible to fracture this component part, the coccyx 
And uh, that's, if anybody has ever had that, that is very painful. A coccygeal fracture is painful. There's not much, there's really nothing you can do about it, but that's one of the issues that we can have. One other problem is if one looks at the configuration of this curvature, you can imagine that the coccyx can be significantly projecting anteriorly and create some issues, for example, with childbirth. So it is not uncommon to have a coccygeal fracture during childbirth because the position of the coccyx is too far forward to present uh, for easy childbirth. So this is an intervertebral disc or a representation of it. And in the center is the nucleus pulposus. It is a thick gelatinous structure and it is derived from what is called the embryonic notochord. That's a component of the embryo that is a midline structure that is very important in the development of the embryo. So part of it is retained as this nucleus pulposus. Again, it is a gelatinous material, relatively thick. It's about 88% water at birth, so high water content. That's good news because it acts as a shock absorber for the vertebral column. So you can imagine you've got a vertebral body above, a vertebral body below, in the intervertebral disc intervening. And with this high water content, about 88% water, it does have compressibility as long as that water content is retained. The bad news is we lose water with time. So the body tends to desiccate with age. So by the age of 70, we are only about 70% water in the nucleus pulposus, in this intervertebral disc. So the compressibility is reduced. The ability to uh, absorb impact is reduced. And so it puts more pressure on the body uh, to support it and can create issues. So it does become more fibrous with time, which creates situations where a herniation is far more possible in time because of that fibrous nature. And then surrounding the nucleus pulposus is the series of concentric fibrous rings, so annulus fibrosus. That's what we have are these, all of these concentric rings of fibrous tissue that surround the nucleus pulposus and a disc herniation occurs when the annulus ruptures and it allows the nucleus pulposus material to ooze out, for lack of a better description. So you can imagine if that annulus fibrosus created rupture due to pressures from above, overuse injuries, that it would create an opportunity for this tissue to actually follow that line of damage to the annulus fibrosus and herniate out. And once that happens, once we have that kind of a herniation, we can put pressure on, cause damage to an exiting spinal nerve. So this is a spinal nerve indicated here, and then this herniation can put pressure on the spinal nerve. We'll talk more about that later. So this is a cross-section of a vertebral column with several elements being visible. There are the concentric rings, the annulus fibrosus. You can get an indication of that in that particular view. The nucleus pulposus that is central in this situation. This is a nucleus pulposus or a vertebral column of an older individual. So you can get a sense of the fact that desiccation has occurred. There is less water in this particular situation. That's a subarachnoid space. We'll talk more about the components contained within the spinal canal in a little while, but that is the subarachnoid space. That is the epidural space, in other words, outside the dura mater. So here we can see the lumbar vertebrae that are now stacked up with the intervening disc and we can see that the disc is actually, when we stack up all of the discs, they're about one-fourth of the length of the full vertebral column. 
So you can imagine that, again, with that high water content, 88% when we're born and 70% when we're 70, as that water content is squeezed out, the vertebral column actually does diminish in size. So when your grandmother seems to be shrinking with age, your grandmother is actually shrinking with age. And again, the other part is that the components of the bodies of the vertebrae actually can start to get compressed for very similar reasons. Again, osteoporosis being the major cause. So there is the intervertebral disc, and you're seeing the external portion, the annulus fibrosis portion. And it doesn't just fit in there. It's actually tightly adherent through a lot of ligamentous type tissue that holds it in place. So the discs do not slide. So the common terminology for a disc herniation is a slipped disc. Well, discs don't slide. They herniate. So the slipped disc terminology is not accurate because they really are held in place. But if you have a herniation that occurs because the annulus fibrosus has ruptured, you can get a disc impinging on adjacent structures. So there is the intervertebral foramen, again formed by the inferior notch on the pedicle above and the superior notch in the pedicle below. Align those in conjunction with the intervertebral disc here and the articular processes that we have there, and we've got a true intervertebral foramen through which a spinal nerve can exit. Other components that we now have holding all of these vertebral elements together, anteriorly, which is the view we see here, we have an anterior longitudinal ligament, and it is on the anterior surfaces of the bodies of the vertebrae running the full length of the vertebral column. If there's an anterior longitudinal ligament, there will be a posterior longitudinal ligament. That's anatomical terminology is very predictable in that way. So those are located on the posterior aspects of the body of the vertebrae, and again, will attach from adjacent body to adjacent body, etc. So it runs the length of the vertebral column as well. So there we can see the anterior longitudinal ligament and the thinner, less narrow, posterior longitudinal ligament. Anterior on the anterior aspects of the bodies of the vertebrae, posterior on the posterior aspects of the bodies of the vertebrae. And then the spinal cord will live right in this canal that we now have formed here. Additionally, we've got the ligamentum flavum, and flavum means yellow. So a yellowish ligament, and one can kind of get a, a hint of the yellow nature of that ligament. It is a very dense ligament, and it attaches from lamina, to lamina, so it holds the laminae together, and again is a very dense ligament. So during a lumbar puncture, when one takes the course that the arrow has taken and comes through the elements which we'll describe in just a second, but this is a supraspinous, an interspinous ligament, and gets to the ligamentum flavum and tries to poke through the ligamentum flavum, there will be resistance from that dense ligamentum flavum. When one finally penetrates it, it goes through with a bit of a pop, and one can feel that process occur. So again, supraspinous ligament, which is a longitudinal element, and it runs spinous process to spinous process, again, the full length of the vertebral column. And then a segmented ligament, like the ligamentum flavum is a segmented ligament, is the interspinous ligament attaching spinous process to spinous process. So again, during lumbar puncture, one goes through the skin and, and the subcutaneous tissue, then gets to the supraspinous ligament, the interspinous ligament, the ligamentum flavum, and that brings you into what would be the epidural space outside the dura. So that would be around this area, and we'll talk more about that. The back muscles, so we'll talk about the structures that now are attaching in this particular region, allowing us to do some of those motions, lateral flexion and rotation and 
flexion extension, that kind of thing. So this is a view of the back and the extrinsic muscles are actually muscles of the upper extremity. So it should be an ex upper extremity. So we will see that they attach to the girdle of the upper extremity and they allow us to uh, position our shoulder components, those kinds of things. So the first muscle that we see is the trapezius. Trapezius means irregular and it attaches from what's called the superior nuchal line on the base of the skull and through the cervical spinous processes and the spinous processes in the thoracic region, usually all the way down to the last spinous process in the thoracic region, in other words, TV12. It can stop a little higher, it can go a little lower. There is a considerable amount of variability um, in the body in that regard. So one thing to keep in mind is we all look different on the outside, and consequently, there will be things that look different on the inside when we compare one to another. For example, the trapezius on one side, again, could be from superior nuchal line, our spinous processes and cervical and thoracic region, all the way down to TV12. And then, doing like it's supposed to do, run out and attach to the spine of the scapula. That's what that is. That's the spine of the scapula and it attaches to the acromion of the scapula, and it comes around and attaches to the clavicle, specifically the lateral third of the clavicle. So it's attached all around, if you will, uh, this region of the shoulder. So um, that's what it normally does, but I have seen where it's typical on one side of the body, and on the other side of the body might be significantly smaller than we typically uh, identify. So in other words, it could come up like this and come down to about there and be thinner, less of an um, observed muscle, uh, consequently significantly less functional. So the trapezius muscle, trapezius means irregular. So it is irregular in outline. It's not tubular or rectangular. It does have this irregular outline that we have seen. The upper fibers will pull the shoulders up. The middle fibers will actually retract the scapula, pull backward, pull in that direction, and the lower fibers will pull down on the scapula. So they'll depress the scapula up and down and moving back. The really neat thing about this particular muscle, or one really neat thing, is if the upper fibers which attach way out here on the acromion, if they work together with the medial fibers here that attach on this aspect of the spine of the scapula, if those two pull simultaneously, contract simultaneously, so this is pulling down, this is pulling up, the thing that happens is the scapula actually rotates. So think of this as the pivot point. This is being pulled that way, this is being pulled that way, and the shoulder, actually the scapula, rotates. So it moves that way, that way. And that's particularly important when we want to reach as high as we can, get that cereal box on the top shelf, if you will. The scapula must rotate so that what's called the glenoid fossa, where the humerus articulates, that glenoid fossa can be moved to a more superior orientation, allowing full abduction at the shoulder. So that's particularly um, important. So the trapezius is one of the muscles that allows us to rotate that scapula so that we can fully abduct. Without rotation, this is as far as we get. So we only get about 120 degrees at the shoulder. So rotation is important. This muscle is supplied by the spinal accessory nerve. So it's actually a cranial nerve, cranial nerve 11, the spinal accessory nerve. Interesting muscle. It comes from the upper portion of the spinal cord, spinal origin, hence the name, and it actually carries some of its fibers and 
brings them, it goes up into the uh, skull, so it goes through foramen magnum, and it transfers some of its motor fibers to the vagus nerve, so it becomes accessory to the vagus. It gives those fibers to the vagus. And those fibers come back down and they supply the larynx, and they supply the pharynx. So those muscles actually get their nerve supply from what should be this spinal accessory muscle, or pardon me, spinal accessory nerve, but they transfer those fibers to the vagus. So the recurrent laryngeal and the external laryngeal branches of the vagus are actually derived from the spinal origin. As we continue with extrinsic muscles, we have the latissimus dorsi. Latissimus means widest, dorsi means it's on the dorsal side or on the back. So it's the widest muscle on the back. And you can see it's pretty significant in width. So it's attaching to the spinous processes of lower thoracic and the lumbar vertebrae and to the iliac crest and to this tissue which is called thoracolumbar fascia. So thoracolumbar fascia. And that fascia, we'll talk more about that later, but it's attaching to the spinous processes and encloses the deeper muscles of the back. We'll see that again. So this particular muscle goes up and it attaches to the inside um, or passes through the inside of the upper extremity and attaches right here on the uh, anterior aspect of the humerus in what's called the intertubercular sulcus. So when this particular muscle contracts, it takes the extremity and adducts it, in other words, brings it closer to the body, extends it, brings it back, and it internally, internally rotates it. So it puts the extremity, if, if you put your arm behind your waist, you're using this muscle to get it, get it there. The nerve supply is the thoracodorsal nerve. So again, thoracal, thoracodorsal, it's on that part of the body. And it has spinal segments C6, 7, and 8. Those are coming from what's called the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. So it's a posterior cord of the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus will be reviewed in a subsequent lecture. Another extrinsic muscle is called levator scapulae. It attaches to the superior angle of the scapula and goes up and attaches to those transverse processes of cervical vertebrae. So it takes the scapula and elevates it, helps pull it up along with the upper fibers of the trapezius. So it is supplied by nerves to levator scapulae, C3 and C4 from the cervical plexus. Down below it, inferior to it, is rhomboid minor muscle. Uh, rhomboid minor muscle attaches to the vertebral edge of the scapula right at the level of where the spine of the scapula is. In other words, underneath, right underneath this point right here. So that's rhomboid minor, and it goes up, uh, ascends, and attaches to lower cervical spinous processes. And below it is rhomboid major. It's the larger of the two rhomboid muscles. So you can see it attaching to the vertebral edge of the scapula and then our upper thoracic spinous processes. So these two muscles will help pull the scapula toward the midline, retract the scapula, uh, along with those medial fibers of the trapezius. And you can see that they're somewhat obliquely oriented. So they can also rotate the scapula in a direction that's uh, counter to what the trapezius does. So they unrotate what the trapezius did to allow us to um, elevate our scapula, our glenoid fossa. So they undo that action. And the nerve supply to the rhomboids is the dorsal scapular nerve. It comes from spinal segment C5, again, off of the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus is C5 to T1 spinal segments. So this is from the upper portion of the uh, brachial plexus. As we continue with extrinsic muscles, 
Another one that's a very interesting muscle is serratus anterior. Serratus, because as it attaches to the rib cage anteriorly, it attaches to adjacent ribs and it gives, if you will, a serrated appearance. So the jagged appearance you have with a serrated knife, that's how this appears as it attaches to the rib cage on the lateral side of the body. Its posterior attachment is going to be to the anterior aspect of the vertebral edge of the scapula. So right on the anterior surface of the scapula where I have drawn. So this particular muscle is important in doing push-ups. So taking the scapula and sliding it around the body it very importantly holds the scapula against the body wall. So when you reach forward, this muscle keeps the scapula against the body. Another thing that it does is because of the angle of the fibers, it also pulls down on this vertebral edge of the scapula and allowing again for the glenoid fossa to elevate. So it assists the trapezius in that rotation of the scapula so that we can fully abduct. The ability to hold that muscle to the body wall is very important. So the nerve supply to this is called a long thoracic nerve. It comes from the proximal part of the brachial plexus, C5, C6, and C7. And uh, it travels down through the neck and it travels through the axilla to get to the lateral side, the external surface, the superficial part of the serratus anterior. So in situations where there's axillary damage or in situations where a surgeon, for example, after a mastectomy has to recover some axillary lymph nodes, this particular nerve is very much at risk. So cervical trauma, axillary trauma, trauma to the lateral side of the thorax can cause damage to that nerve and lose function of the serratus anterior. And when that happens, you have winging of the scapula. So you get a wing scapula. What that really means is if you do reach or push against the side of uh, a wall, the scapula will actually flip out, flip off of the side of the body. So it'll look like a little wing on one's back. So winging of the scapula, a wing scapula, this is an important problem. So each of those muscles, again, was supplied by usually a branch of the brachial plexus. And the brachial plexus, I will give you an indication of how that is actually formed. A ventral root is a motor root coming from the ventral portion of the spinal cord. So the cell body of this root has its location in the anterior aspect, anterior horn of the spinal cord, right in there. So the fibers from those anterior horn cells will exit the spinal cord and will be leaving through the intervertebral foramen as a spinal nerve, as we will see. The sensory component, so... Again, ventral root was motor. The dorsal root is sensory. So those are fibers that are coming into the spinal cord. So they are coming in, creating attachments inside the spinal cord so that we have conscious awareness of being touched. Um, we have an awareness within the body of whether our muscles are contracted or relaxed. So there are a lot of types of sensory fibers that we have, but they are coming into, coming from the body and coming into the spinal cord so that we can then act on those. So if we touch something hot, that awareness comes back to the spinal cord, gets into the spinal cord, and will actually connect to an interneuron which will then cause the motor fibers to allow us to pull away from that hot object. So the motor fibers have their cell body in the anterior horn. Again, that's anterior horn of the spinal cord. But the sensory cell bodies are located in a ganglion, in a dorsal root ganglion. 
So again, it's the dorsal root we're talking about, and the cell bodies are physically located in this enlargement called the dorsal root ganglion. The next element out or subdivision out is the spinal nerve itself. And the spinal nerve is formed where we have the ventral root and the dorsal root attached. So if we took a bunch of uh, electrical wires and we brought them together and wrapped them up with electrical tape, we've formed, if you will, a spinal nerve. That's the configuration that we have in that particular location. It is physically present at the intervertebral foramen. That's where one would find a spinal nerve, physically located at an intervertebral foramen. And again, it's the union of those sensory fibers from the dorsal root and the motor fibers from the ventral root. We then pass a little more lateral and we branch that spinal nerve into a ventral branch. That's what ramus means. It means branch. So you could say a ventral ramus. You could say an anterior branch. It's the same thing. Again, we would have sensory and motor fibers contained in that once we've gone past where the spinal nerve is. So these are the components, the branches, that are involved in the formation of the brachial plexus that supplies the upper extremity. And again, these extrinsic muscles that we're dealing with on the back. So that's what they do. They supply these extrinsic muscles. So the ones that we have already seen, like the latissimus dorsi, like the rhomboid major and minor. So that's where they come from. They also will pass through in this brachial plexus in a strange pattern, which we will talk about later. The dorsal ramus, or the dorsal branch, or posterior branch, again, contains sensory and motor fibers. And those dorsal rami have unique function. They will supply the intrinsic back muscles that we will talk about in a short while. So if we go deep to the extrinsic muscles, in other words, trapezius has been cut away, and then we will take the rhomboids and cut those away as well. And we will get to what are called the intermediate muscles, and those are serratus posterior superior and serratus posterior inferior. We had serratus anterior, now these are again serrated because they attach to the ribs and they give this jagged or serrated appearance as they attach. But these are actually additional muscles of respiration. So these will pull up on the rib cage to help us take a breath. These will pull down on the rib cage to help us expire uh, the air. So inspiration, serratus posterior is superior, expiration, serratus posterior inferior. And they are supplied by intercostal nerves, nerves that live in the spaces between the ribs, intercostal. So in other words, they are ventral rami. So that's what we're supplying there, the intermediate back muscles through these intercostals. And again, not the dorsal rami, which are now going to come into play. So these are the true or deep or intrinsic back muscles. So we are now utilizing, again, the dorsal rami, the dorsal branch off of our spinal nerve. So there's our spinal nerve. Here is the branch coming posteriorly. And again, in this space between transverse processes and spinous processes are the intrinsic or the true back muscles. So the dorsal rami are going to supply those in a segmental fashion. In other words, just this region, this region, this region, this region as we come down. So you saw how the vertebral column was segmented. Well, the nerves that are supplying the muscles that attach to those vertebral elements are similarly segmented. So you only supply a section of an intrinsic back muscle. 
And then from a sensory standpoint, they will supply the skin that overlies those intrinsic back muscles. So our intrinsic muscles, we have a superficial layer and some of those are the splenius. Splenius wraps around the neck, as you can see here, attaching to the mastoid process. That would be splenius capitis and to the transverse processes in the cervical region. That would be splenius cervicis. So they come from, if you will, the spinous processes, upper thoracic, and they go to transverse processes in the cervical region. So what they will do is pull the head toward the same side. So if these on the right are contracting, it pulls the head toward the right, makes us look toward the right. So that's splenius. Splenius means bandage because it looks like it's wrapped around the head. Splenius means bandage. Again, turns the head towards the same side if working unilaterally. If they work bilaterally, both together, both sides together, they help with extension at the neck. So again, dorsal rami in the cervical and upper thoracic region. Then we have an intermediate layer of muscles, and these are the erector spiny, and they do just what their name says. They hold our spine erect. They help us extend the vertebral column. So spinalis is the most medial component, and it's going several levels, spine, spinous process to spinous process, hence the name spinalis. So the next one going out is longissimus, and they are coming for the most part from the spinous processes, as you can see here, and going out and attaching to transverse processes in a little bit to the adjacent rib. But for the most part, spinous process to transverse process. And again, like spinalis, all of these guys, all of these erector spiny are supplied by dorsal rami. The third component of erector spiny are iliocostalis, so attaching to the iliac crest, if you will, and going out and attaching to the ribs. That's what costalis is, so you can see that happening. So these muscles, for the most part, will extend. You can see how the most lateral ones, the iliocostalis, might produce a little bit of lateral flexion. And again, all supplied by dorsal rami. So segmentally supplied. So if the nerve is exiting at this level, it will supply muscles in this region. If a nerve is exiting at this level, it will supply muscles in that region. And then it supplies the skin that overlies those muscles. So the skin all the way down there on one side, all the way down here on the other side. And again, in a segmental fashion. So this nerve that supplied that chunk of muscle will supply that region of skin just over the top of it. So it creates what we call a dermatome pattern, innervation to the skin, to the dermis and to the epidermis. So that is a segmental pattern we will see. So again, we're talking about these dorsal rami supplying the intrinsic muscles, the erector spiny, and then the deeper ones, which are called the transversal spinal. So the transversal spinal are subdivided into different component parts, semispinalis, and they go six to eight vertebral levels, somewhere along there. So you can see how they're coming from a transverse process and going up to a spinous process several levels higher transverse process to a spinous process, transversal spinal. So that's semispinalis going several levels. Slightly shorter will be the multifidus. They go about four levels. So again, spinous process and go up about four levels higher to a spinous process. And then the third, the deepest of these, but the third subdivision will be rotatories. So their name kind of suggests what their main function is, and that is rotation. So they're going from a transverse process to a spinous process immediately above or an additional level, two levels above. So one or two levels. So what they do is they take the spinous process 
and draw it toward, because that's what happens to muscle, when a muscle contracts, it brings its two points of attachment closer together. So it takes that spineless process, brings it toward that transverse process, and it does that posteriorly, which causes the front to rotate toward the opposite side. So transversal spinal, especially the rotatories, rotate you to the opposite side of the body. And again, innervated segmentally by dorsal rami. So the ones here will be supplied by the guys that are exiting the vertebral column right at that level. So in this case, this is the 12th rib, subcostal nerve T12 is there, T11 is here, T10 is there. So T9 is there, so the muscles in this region would be T10, up here T9, etc. So segmental. And then the skin overlying them. So there are the dorsal rami supplying those intrinsic muscles, erector spiny, transversal spinal, again with the subdivisions that we have. And then the skin overlying them. So these are cutaneous branches. They're going to the skin. So you can see that the nerve comes through the muscle and then divides into this medial and lateral branch to supply the skin that's overlying this in these intrinsic muscles. Interestingly, as they go to the skin, they are piercing the rhomboid. There's the rhomboid. So, and they are piercing the trapezius. So they go through the rhomboid, go through the trapezius. Do not supply those muscles. Remember, the rhomboid was supplied by dorsal scapular, and the trapezius was supplied by cranial nerve 11, right? Spinal accessory. So they go through the muscles, those other muscles, and then come to the skin to supply the skin over it via these cutaneous branches. Interestingly, as those nerves go through, penetrate these muscles that they don't supply, sometimes those muscles, if we say go work out excessively and our muscles are tense, they can actually compress these nerves that are coursing through and produce significant localized pain. And that localized pain is commonly called a trigger, trigger point. So that trigger point, again, very, can be very localized, especially where we go through rhomboid and go through trapezius. Uh, so inflammation of the muscles, pressure on the nerve, and the only thing you can do is just push on those muscles until they relax locally, and it works reasonably well. Trigger point. So this shows you the cutaneous branches of the dorsal rami as they're coming through the skin, medial and lateral branches, in supplying the skin over the intrinsic back muscles. So it'll give rise to, again, a dermatome pattern, a segmental pattern of innervation. And that dermatome pattern is indicated here. So that's what we have, our segmented elements. So this is the first thoracic, second thoracic, third, right on down. This is the first lumbar, second lumbar, third lumbar, etc. supplied by those nerves. And in, if we're talking about, again, our dorsal rami, so those are dorsal rami supplying on one side of the midline and the other side of the midline, supplying those particular segmental sections. The rest is by ventral rami all the way around to the midline. So ventral rami fills in this again on one side and the ventral ramus from the other side, the other aspect of the body, the other half, if you will. So that's our dermatome pattern. If you look at it, this is the level of the nipple is the fourth thoracic spinal nerve. And in this case, ventral ramus here dorsal ramus back here, pardon me, dorsal ramus back here. This would be ventral ramus, and this would be the dorsal ramus, right, of T4. T10 is the area of the umbilicus, so again, trace it all the way around the body, ventral ramus, dorsal ramus. L1 is the suprapubic region. We'll talk more about the ones to the extremities at another point. The central nervous system components, we'll take a, a deeper look at those specifically the spinal nerve, the spinal cord, and the vascular supply to the spinal cord.
So here we have an image of the spinal cord that gives rise again. So there is our cord. That's the dorsal root, which are the sensory guys coming in. And the way I know that is I see the dorsal root ganglion. That's where the sensory cell bodies live. So the cell body of this sensory nerve coming into the spinal cord. And the ventral root is going to be more anteriorly located. So this is posterior in this view, and anterior is at the front of the screen, so that's anterior there. And the cell bodies of the ventral roots uh, fibers are in the anterior horn. So those are, again, anterior horn cells. And they are motor. So those motor fibers are then coming out and going in that direction. And our spinal nerve is where those roots join. And our dorsal ramus are the combined sensory motor fibers that are going posteriorly to our intrinsic back muscles, motor to those and to the skin overlying those. And the ventral ramus are going to the rest of the body wall and through the brachial plexus to the elements of the upper extremity, for example. We have the same thing with the lower extremity. That is what's called a spinal segment. So it's a portion of the cord that gives rise to a pair of spinal nerves, two spinal nerves, one on each side. So there's spinal nerve on that side, spinal nerve on that side. So that's a spinal segment. So in this particular view, we have, there's one spinal segment there and a second spinal segment here. The, uh, in this particular view, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six spinal segments that are indicated. So again, six pairs of spinal nerves. The pia mater, which we see here, is the skin of the spinal cord. So it's intimately on the spinal cord. You can't really dissect the pia off. You can see it histologically, but you can't take it off similar to being hard to take our skin off of us, although it's doable. Appeal specialization is the denticulate ligament. So off of the side of the spinal cord is this connective tissue that we call denticulate ligament because it, again, is serrated like teeth or whatever happened to be, like we saw the teeth of a saw blade. So it's serrated, and it attaches to the inside of what we'll see is the dura. So what it does is, because it's a continuation of the pia, of that skin coming off the side, it holds the spinal cord in place relatively sec securely inside these meninges, inside these membranes. So the arachnoid is a very thin membrane. It actually splits off from the pia developmentally, and it's a very thin membrane, as I said, and deep to it is the subarachnoid space where the cerebrospinal fluid is retained. So big fluid-filled space deep to that arachnoid. And then outside the arachnoid, external to it, is the dura mater. Dura being tough, very dense connective tissue. So it surrounds the spinal cord, it surrounds the elements coming off of the spinal cord to the spinal nerve, and once the rami, the spinal nerve, exit the vertebral column, and not shown here, but the dura actually comes off of the spinal nerve and fuses with the periosteum of the bone at the intervertebral foramen. So pia, arachnoid, with its subarachnoid space. Dura, uh, with its epidural space. So there's a space around the dura inside the vertebral column. And that epidural space has uh, a plexus of veins called the internal vertebral venous plexus. And it's got a considerable amount of fat in that space. So here is a view of the same thing. So if we look at the components that we have, here is again the spinal cord, and this would be where the anterior horn cells live. These are the ventral uh, roots, or that is a ventral root, one on one side, one on the other. The dorsal root 
coming into the posterior side of the spinal cord with its cell body living in the dorsal root ganglion. Here again is the spinal nerve at the level of the intervertebral foramen. It's always located there, as is the dorsal root ganglion. So if you want to find them in the body, you look at the intervertebral foramen. And then we have the dorsal ramus and the ventral ramus. So dorsal ramus and, of course, then the ventral ramus. So on the cord is the pia. We don't really see the arachnoid in this view because it's so thin, but we can see the dura mater. There's the dura surrounding the cord. And as you can see, going off on the, as the spinal nerve is exiting, it's in a sheath or a sleeve of dura. And then actually this dura will leave and fuse with the periosteum of the bone as it exits. And this is the epidural space outside the dura. And again, you can see the fat and you can see the internal vertebral, internal vertebral venous plexus. If there's an internal vertebral venous plexus, there will be an external vertebral venous plexus. External vertebral venous plexus. And they interconnect. And they interconnect via these branches that go through the intervertebral foramen. They interconnect via these veins that actually go through the bone. So bone is very vascularized. And you can see these vessels that are in the bone itself. So here is the brain, and here is a spinal cord that is coming off of the base of the brain. And we have the spinal cord that happens to be C3 spinal segment, and below it are the elements of the brachial plexus. Again, T5, or C5 to T1, pardon me. And you can see how the plexus is going to partially form, in this case, in very complex pattern. We talked about the dermatome and an area of skin supplied by a single spinal segment on most of the body via ventral rami, and then deep to the skin posteriorly by the dorsal rami. So there's, again, as I said, we can see the area of the male nipple, and that's going to be T4 there. We can see C5, which is right across the chest and on the shoulder. So that's C5, we've got T4 that's indicated, T10, L1, and then going to the thumb is C6. Middle finger is C7, and then the little finger is C8, and coming back up to the axilla, it's T1. So we've got these landmark components that are really helpful in diagnosing issues, letting us know when things are problematic. So if you had, uh, you say, in a whiplash injury kind of thing, and then you end up with numbness of your thumb from it, as can happen, um, you know it's a C6 problem. So just using that as an example. Innervation to the face itself, so sensory innervation to the face is actually through the trigeminal nerve. So that's cranial nerve five is the trigeminal. It has trigeminal, three parts to it. So V1 goes to the forehead, called a frontonasal prominence. V2 goes to the maxillary region, called a maxillary division of five to the maxillary swelling. And V3 goes to the chin, to the mandible, and that's the mandible, mandibular division of five. So cranial nerve five here, and then our spinal nerves everywhere else. Um, we talked about the fact that we have a spinal segment is a pair of spinal nerves coming off of a region of the spinal cord. The spinal cord has 31 spinal segments, or in other words, 31 spinal nerves, 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So there are eight in the cervical region. And if you remember correctly, there are seven cervical vertebrae. So there's an offset there. And that offset indicates that the first cervical spinal nerve comes out above, above the same numbered vertebra. So C1, C1 is above CV1, if you will. So eight cervical spinal nerves, that's what we have there. Twelve thoracic spinal nerves, 
Same number of vertebrae, so we're okay with that. Five lumbar, again, matches up with the vertebral elements. Five sacral, also matches. And then one coccygeal, single coccygeal spinal segment, uh, giving rise to those coccygeal nerves. So the numbering, again, affects the nerves as they exit the vertebral column. So we have to try to figure that out. And again, I told you that C1 exits above what would be here indicated as CV1. So in the cervical region, the nerves exit above the same numbered vertebra. So C1 above CV1, et cetera, right on down. But then again, we'll have to change that because we run out of vertebral elements in the cervical region. So C8 comes out below CV7. So TV1, just below it, will be T1. T1, in other words, comes out below TV1. This will be clearer in this figure. So this is a very diagrammatic representation of the spinal cord here in the cervical and the thoracic and the lumbar region, and again, down towards the lower sacral components in coccygeal. So what one can see is that, again, in the cervical region, C1 comes out above CV1. So that's what's diagrammatically represented here, C1 above CV1. C4 above CV4. The cervical nerve number four comes out above the cervical vertebrae number four, and so on. But as we go down to CV7, C7 comes out above CV7, and then C8 comes out below it. So from there on, down the rest of the length of the spinal cord slash vertebral column, nerves exit below the same numbered vertebra. Cervical region above, everywhere else below. It's just that simple. So again, all other ones enter or exit the vertebral column below the same numbered vertebra. So indicated there is L4 coming out below LV4. So again, reviewing that cervical region, they come out above the same numbered vertebra. So you know, C1 is coming out way above or just above CV1. All other levels below. So L4 comes out below LV4. Simple concept. And the reason for it again, the offset in the cervical region eight cervical spinal nerves, seven vertebrae. So it's quite simple. S5 and the coccygeal spinal segment nerves exit through the sacral hiatus. They come out and go down through that hiatus. The inferior portion of the spinal cord, if you looked at this view, you could say, see that the spinal cord comes down and it stops there. It does not go all the way down into the sacrum. Developmentally, it does. In the embryo, remember we talked about the concavity, the single primary curvature. So in the case of that particular concavity, if this is the brain and spinal cord of a little guy, he matches up spinal nerve to vertebral elements. So when we get down to the bottom of the spinal cord, we are down at the bottom of the vertebral column. But then we undergo differential growth. So not only do we change that single primary curvature, but we also will have the vertebral column growing faster than the spinal cord. So the spinal cord, if you will, gets left behind. So the spinal cord grows a bit, but the vertebral column grows faster and longer. So here you can see the full length of the vertebral column and internally the full length of the spinal cord in the adult. So the point is the spinal cord ends at about LV1, LV2. The spinal cord, the bottom of the cord, ends at LV1 or LV2 in the adult. It goes lower in the infant because the infant is still undergoing that differential growth. So when doing a lumbar puncture in a newborn, it is very important to remember that the spinal cord descends lower, is longer, relatively speaking, than it is in an adult. Very important concept. Um, much simpler than it really does sound, but the bottom line is differential growth causes the vertebral column to grow 
faster and further than the spinal cord. So the spinal cord has to end at a higher level, LV1 to LV2. So then we come looking at the other elements that we have here. This is the bottom of the dura and the subarachnoid space. That ends at about SV2. So even the dura and the subarachnoid space don't go all the way down to the very bottom of the spinal of the vertebral column. So spinal cord ends at LV1-2 in the adult, a little lower in, the, in an infant. And then the subarachnoid space and the dura um, end considerably lower, that is at SV2. So where, what do we have in that space between where the cord ends and where the dura ends? What we've got are all these descending nerves that are exiting at a lower level below LV1. So they go through what's called this cauda equina, horse's tail. They will travel through this horse's tail to get to other levels of the vertebral column. So when you're in the fetal stage, embryonic stage, the nerves come out and they exit straight out of the vertebral column at the same level. But when that differential growth occurs, nerves are brought down. They still exit where they're supposed to. So L4 still exits below LV4, but remember, the cord ends at LV1 and LV4 is down here. So those nerves have to descend. A little muddy here. Those nerves have to, uh, so there's the end of the cord. Again, LV1. The spinal segment for L4 is about there and the nerves will descend and then they will exit. So these descending fibers are again, cauda equina. Simple concept. Um, again, sounds a little complicated, but it's a pretty simple concept. Spinal cord ends uh, above the inferior aspect of the vertebral column, so nerves have to descend to get to their appropriate level. So the bottom portion of the spinal cord where our coccygeal spinal segment and our uh, sacral spinal segments are uh, located are in this conal part, it's tapering down. That's called conus medullaris. And those are the lowest elements of the spinal cord. And they give rise to, as I said, the sacral and coccygeal spinal segments. The phylum terminale is another interesting little connective tissue piece coming off of the pia or coming down from the pia. So it is the peel continuation of the spinal cord. So in other words, if this is the spinal cord, we know the skin is pia. And then because of that differential growth, remember this in the, in the newborn, um, pardon me, in the fetus, was the same length as the vertebral column. But because of that differential growth, the spinal cord is now shorter, but that's a pretty bad looking spinal cord, but the Pia still has its attachment, if you will, to the bottom of the vertebral column. So that peel attachment is called phylum terminale. So it's coming off the end of the cord, so it starts again at LV1, and then it actually pierces the dura. So if we call this dura, it pierces the dura as the coccygeal ligament, and it attaches down to the coccyx. So that's phylum terminale. It's just a landmark structure that one can see. So with the head being up in this direction as indicated here, we can see the spinal cord and we can see the descending nature of these spinal nerves as they're coming off the spinal cord to exit the vertebral column at the appropriate level, which is more downstream. So in other words, forming a cauda equina. So there is the spinal cord in the dural sheath, and there are our spinal nerves exiting the vertebral column, as you can see there. So LV1, there we have that body of the vertebrae, and this is the disc between LV2 and LV3. So it's the LV23 intervertebral disc. 
The question is what would happen if that particular disc were to herniate in a posterior lateral direction, in other words, toward this intervertebral foramen. What's going to happen? So let's take a look at intervertebral foramen. So for example, here's LV34. So what happens if we have an LV45 herniation? So that's this guy here, right? What happens if that herniates? So it's going to herniate in, again, a posterior lateral direction, just like the red arrow is indicating. So remember, we have nerves that are exiting through intervertebral foramen, as I indicated before. So on the surface of it, expect that this disc herniation of LV45 would damage the nerve that's exiting at that level. And if you remember what the nerve is, Remember nerves, this is LV4, in the lumbar region, nerves exit below the same numbered vertebral elements. So L4 spinal nerve is going to exit below LV4. And you would expect that that herniation of LV4-5 disc would impinge on L4 nerve, but in fact it usually doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is the nerve exits at the very top of this, what is now elongated intervertebral foramen, as you can kind of see there. It's elongated. So the nerve tends to exit at the upper portion of it, and the herniation goes toward the lower portion of it. Why does that happen? Again, the differential growth, the increase in size in these lumbar vertebrae, the increase um, in the oval characteristics of the intervertebral foramen allow the nerve to be pulled up, if you will, in that intervertebral foramen so that this particular disc herniation doesn't affect that one, but what it does affect is the nerve that's going to be coming out down here. So it would affect L5 spinal nerve in most circumstances. It affects the guy coming out at the space below. So an LV4-5 herniation will affect L5. So there's the LV4 pedicle. Again, we just mentioned that the spinal nerve that is most at risk of damage will be L5 that's exiting at the level below. So this is a better representation of that, if you will. It shows you an LV4-5 disc herniation, and this is L4, and it is not impinging on it. But this is L5 exiting nerve, and you can see how, because it's kind of tethered in this space, that posterior lateral herniation of the disc affects the guy that's going to be coming out a little bit lower. So it affects that one. We talked about the fact that the vertebral artery is going through the transverse foramen, but it's supplying the spinal cord with anterior and posterior spinal arteries right as it gets to the foramen magnum. So here is the base of our brain, and we can see in the base of our brain that's the right vertebral artery. The left vertebral artery is actually over here. They've kind of shifted when we took the brain out. But that's the left vertebral. This is the basilar, and that's where the left and right vertebrals fuse to form the basilar. And just before that are where our spinal arteries come off and go to the spinal cord. So again, basilar formed by the union of vertebrals. And this is a diagrammatic representation of what I just mentioned. So these are the vertebrals that are coming up on both sides, and that is an anterior view. So this would be the left, and this would be the right vertebral, and you can see how they give rise, the vertebrals give rise to that anterior spinal artery. And that's what we see here. That's an anterior spinal artery. And these are paired posterior, posterior spinal arteries, one on each side. So again, vertebral giving rise to those that come on down. So anterior and paired posterior spinal arteries. Now, in order for the entire spinal cord to get blood supply, you'd have to have a pretty good sized artery to travel at full length of the spinal cord. Well, we don't have that. We're in a confined space. Spinal cord needs blood supply, but it's in a small tight space, the cord in the vertebral column, in the vertebral canal. 
So the way to adjust to that situation is you form the spinal arteries at the top of the spinal cord, but then you augment those spinal arteries with these segmental medullary arteries. That's what they're called. They are coming off of, for the most part, intercostal arteries, those arteries at intercostal spaces. And they will come off those and they will go through the intervertebral foramen and go and connect to, augment, supply additional blood to the spinal cord on the anterior and to some extent on the posterior side. So that's what we see here, these segmental medullary arteries supplying additional blood in. So let me go back to this. There is this particular one that is called the great segmental, great segmental medullary artery. So he is the major one, and he usually comes off the ninth intercostal artery. So T9 is where he originates. So in cases where someone is going in and fixing um, an abdominal aneurysm, so if you got triple A or you got a thoracic aneurysm, you go in, and if you've got the aorta coming down and the aorta has an aneurysm where the wall is dissecting, a dissecting aneurysm. One comes in and puts in a Dacron sleeve and reestablishes the integrity of the aorta, if you will. So if the great segmental medullary comes off of the ninth intercostal, let's just say that's right there, and you put in this Dacron sleeve and you occlude blood flow into the ninth intercostal space, you've got a problem. You got less of a problem with the body wall, but you've got a significant problem with blood flow into, into the spinal cord. So it's very possible to have ischemic loss of the spinal cord below that point, especially on the anterior side of the spinal cord and we know that the motor portion is anterior, so you can lose motor supply below that particular level. And so that's not good. It can affect lower extremities, it can affect function in the pelvic area, etc. Great segmental medullary artery. It's also called the artery of Adamkowitz. 